Good morning, everybody. My name is Scott Jangro, and I am moderating this small panel, but small but powerful panel of um, Vlad and Oliver. I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, this is titled The E-Commerce Power of Content. There are no slides. We're just going to uh, go through some questions and then answer yours. Uh, we all know how important content is, and um, then the question is, you know, what do you do with it? And how can you create great content, but more importantly, what's it worth? How can you monetize it? How can you turn it into revenue? And that's what these two guys are experts at. Um, but I'm Scott Jangaro. My company is Sharist. Uh, Sharist is a content marketing platform uh, helping bloggers, small businesses, agencies manage content, social media, um, and blogging and email all from one platform. And so I do a lot of this stuff myself, and I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Vlad? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Vladimir, or short Vlad uh, Dussel. Um, I started, I'm actually the co-founder, and now a bit of the, I don't know, photographer, CTO, COO, man, many hat-wearing kind of guy at purseblog.com. Uh, we started about 10 years ago. Um, I uh, started with my then girlfriend, now wife Megan. Uh, she's the one who's passionate about bags. I was the one passionate about tech. Um, and yeah, for me, it was sort of like an unlikely venture because, you know, uh, like an average tech loving, car loving, watch loving guy, I had no idea about bags. But then we sort of fell into it because I wanted to be a good boyfriend and support you know, my girlfriend with a, her own website. And now here we are, uh, 10 years later, the premier destination on luxury accessories online, um, sort of monopolizing really that, that realm in that specific niche, which is pretty fascinating. And um, yeah, we've, we've been in this affiliate um, model pretty much from the get-go. Um, we have uh, an exciting editorial. I encourage everyone to check it out. Uh, and then we have also a big forum, which is, you know, the... the original sort of social media uh, platform for people to chat about their passions. So um, that's that's what we do. Uh, I'm Oliver Roop, uh, founder and CEO of Viglink. Uh, Viglink is a technology platform that helps publishers monetize their content. We work with uh, customers like Vlad and others to uh, you know really do a lot of the work involved in monetizing. So I think if the old school world was uh, think up a product you want to promote, go to an affiliate network, find a link, write an article around it, stick the link in the content. Uh, you know, Viglink basically automates a good portion of that work, so you can just write about whatever you like, and we find the best way to monetize it for you and sort of uh, do clever things to drive up as much, how much money you can command uh, for, for the traffic you're driving. Great. Uh, so, you know, as I said, everyone knows content is critical. I'm going to try not to say content is king any time during this presentation. We've heard it way too many times. And it's becoming an industry, content marketing. You know, there's Content Marketing Institute, conferences around it. Um, everybody knows that that's uh, critical. Uh, as the industry becomes more standard and more crowded, uh, what can brands and marketers and uh, bloggers do to, to stand out? I think for us specifically, you know, we've spent especially a good, the last about two years, um, you know, with, with the general sort of nature of, of the internet and everybody contending for uh, each other's attention. Um, it's more important nowadays than ever to spend really close attention to what works with your readership. And we spend so much time in looking, you know, working through the analytics and looking at really tangible statistics to see you know, what really resonates with the reader. What, which techniques can we deploy in order to market the products that we're excited, you know, passionate about and that we want to direct our readers to because we're tastemakers and what really works best. And you know, uh, I think, yeah, of course content still matters, but really the consumer nowadays matters a whole lot more because you have to cater the content to them. And as much as you should stay, you know, um, true to yourself and your, your own opinions and, and maintain your integrity, you know, you need to look at what, what does the reader really resonate, what, what resonates with them, and adjust it accordingly and really pay attention to that. 
So you can't really just blindly just float on and assume that you're going to continue being successful or become successful, because it's just not going to happen. Uh, I would say authenticity is key. I think the game of uh, you know trying to create uh, sort of fake engagement for Google's benefit, that game is either on its way out or over. Uh, Google is smarter than you. They have more data than you. They put more effort into it than you do. Uh, you know, they have become very good at sussing out what is actual content that really engages people and what is fake. And the fake stuff is just not working. Uh, so I'd say number one is you have to create real content that really engages people. Uh, and that largely comes from what you're passionate about or, or you know, those on your team are passionate about. Um, and, and I think, you know, a great example of authenticity, uh, Purse Blog obviously is a great example. Uh, you know, the wire cutter, I think, is another great example of like a site that is very clear, we are here promoting products for you to buy and we make money off it. And they don't sort of pretend they're not doing that, uh, but, but it sort of really engages readers uh, and, and, you know, does very well on, a, um, on an affiliate basis. So I think that, uh, you know, that is key. All the, all the games around link building and, you know, SEO scamming, uh, you know, are basically just failing completely. Yeah, I don't think that we've spent any time for the past, what, three, four years to geared towards like an SEO strategy. Like it's, like Oliver said, he's absolutely right. Google is smarter than you. Like don't try to game the system. It's just not going to happen. If you create great content that people react to, get excited over, Google, oh, Google knows if that is, you know, what you're aiming at. And then organically, the reader will share it with their friends because they're, they think it's like the coolest thing. We've, we've all done it. You see a co cool piece of content and you send it to your friends because you're like, holy crap, this is amazing. So, yeah, don't, don't pay attention to trying to game the system. So no content for the sake of content, server purpose. Um, so that leads to where do you get all this content, and especially this authentic content. You started from zero, obviously, like everyone else did. Yeah. Uh, you know, what is some good advice on how to go about creating content? I mean, it's it's tough, right? It is tough. I mean, for us, it's uh, particularly tough because we are so so niche. And one would think, you know, how much can you really say about a bloody bag? Like, it's a bag. Okay, fine. But there goes a lot more into it. And Says the tech guy. It's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, first of all, consistency. Uh, you have to be consistent with the, with the output, uh, publishing times, the quality of the content. You know, don't uh, make sure that you, you know, proofread your articles before you push them out because, again, you don't want to appear amateurish because, again, Google, for as yeah, well as your reader knows, they will look at it and think, wait a minute, like this fact that you're presenting here is just not true because it's just not true. Google will know that as well. So, you know, proofread, uh, proofread your articles. Um, do it consistently um, and, and build out a team of enthusiasts around you. I mean, I know as a small-time publisher, you might be by yourself or maybe a team of two. Find people who channel your enthusiasm um, and and bring them on to complement, you know, maybe some, some, uh, some talents that you lack, but they're just as passionate as you are, and then that'll channel that into your content. And, um, you know, your success will speak for itself. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it sounds elementary, but creating content is a basic, is, a, is writing, right? It, it is about writing, uh, you know, certainly in this country, mostly English, uh, and, and I think that um, sometimes gets lost, right? It's not about, uh, you know, repurposing or obtaining content. You get, creating content is about writing. Uh, obviously, imagery is a very important part, particularly in, in luxury goods. You know, uh, beautiful imagery sort of make, takes content from boring to engaging. Uh, but we have found that sort of pure image uh, content production does not monetize that well. People love to browse. Uh, but there has to be some sort of engaging writing to anchor around. Uh, I'd say another sort of interesting insight is that um, obviously quality matters, but quantity matters a lot too, right? So, so publishing once a month or once a week is not enough to really engage an audience. Uh, you need to publish often. I think the, the sort of extreme case is we have 
uh, people like Tyler Blake, uh, who's a sneakerhead uh, who works on our platform. Uh, he publishes mostly on Twitter, well, really, really across many social platforms, but we work with him mostly on Twitter. And you don't have to say a lot uh, to tweet, but it is still writing um, and, and imagery. Uh, and, and he is killing it uh, as far as monetization. He writes about sneakers uh, and uh, takes photos of sneakers and people wearing sneakers and talks about sneakers uh, in you know, 140 characters at a time. And uh, you know, his, his results are the envy, would be the envy of this room. So I think um, it has to be a constant signal. I think your audience has to get that dopamine hit of coming back and finding something new that you've said if they come back and you haven't said anything, you know, they'll find someone who's talking. So, so, you know, obviously quality matters, but quantity matters a lot as well. And that's an example of not having to be a prolific writer, uh, you know, to create what you could consider content. So it doesn't always have to be this big, unique, massive, epic post, right? That's right. As long as you are providing information. And he's, he's not creating these sneakers. He's finding them basically doing curation, yeah. uh, finding and sharing things. He also he creates an engagement point for other people to rally around. So, so yeah. if you subscribe to Tyler Blake, you spend a lot of time reading other th people things other people have said to Tyler. Uh, and he, of course, benefits from that. Uh, and so uh, he, he probably does less than 30% of the writing on, you know, if, if you're reading his stream, probably one post in three is actually his. Uh, and, and he benefits a lot from the community he's assembled around him. Mm -hmm. um, more specifically, how does Purse Blog create unique, fresh content? What's your so we have an editorial team uh, that works here out of out of New York. Um, we like to go to product previews. We work closely with brands that over the years we've managed to uh, establish relationships with, with, which wasn't really the easiest thing to do, uh, especially with U European brands that are sort of very much set in their set in their old ways, and then come to them and you try to explain, hey, I have a reach that's larger than many of the magazines that you work with, but they're still, you know, sort of uh, need a little bending and a little massaging in order to make them understand just the power of this, this medium over the years. Um, and, you know, we, we have a, an editorial calendar. We work on our content probably two weeks, three weeks, sometimes even more in advance. We, uh, we do shoots, we do unique shoots. I photograph for our site as well, so I travel a bunch, do, do profiles on, on celebrities and people in fashion, in sports, in all sorts of industries, and try to tie that around, you know, like what's, what's in her bag, what's in his bag, what's, where are the, the many bags of, you know, cool office, and what do those girls wear, and uh, yeah, you know, following up on the previous, uh, on the previous point, yeah, it's very image heavy, heavy but there has to be text with it because, as Oliver correctly said, the the reader they he wants to be he wants to be guided. And while pictures can get people excited, they still want to hear from you as a voice, uh, as a, as a tastemaker. So you know, I've um, over the years we've also established the the voice on our site very clearly and and, and taught our editors to speak in a certain language where it's clear to the reader. These people are the authority. You know, like Blake, he's the authority on sneakers. If I want to know the coolest, latest sneakers, I look at his Twitter stream. And if you look at it, it's the, it's the voice that matters and that captivates the reader. So that's a really, really important point for us. So Viglink doesn't create content. We work with content producers who do. Uh, Vlad is at sort of the very high end. Uh, I think, you know, what he described is essentially a professional operation, which may sound quite intimidating if you're in this room. Uh, it didn't start out that way, right? And there are plenty of uh, there are plenty of publishers we work with who, you know, it's it's a, a guy or a woman in in their dorm room uh, just writing about the things they like. Um, you know, uh, um, you don't need to. Um, have the ears of, of the uh, luxury brands to be able to write about the luxury brands. And I think this is the best time ever to be in that position because brands have started to understand that uh, you know, the features in the major magazines don't drive engagement the way sort of the voices of the people do. Uh, and so they've really started to engage uh, and be excited about you know, like, sure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure Vanity Fair writes about me, but I'm also going to go out and engage a thousand bloggers 
uh, to write about me organically and how can I find those thousand bloggers and how do I encourage them to write about me. Uh, so, so there is demand out there, absolutely. Uh, and you can start very humbly, uh, but it takes patience and time and, and energy. And, and, I mean, this is self-serving, but I'd say the, the only part of this game that only humans can do is, is the content creation, the writing and the creativity. All the mechanics around how much am I getting paid and how's it working, uh, every hour you spend doing that is an hour you don't spend writing content. And, and so obviously our view is don't do the mechanical stuff that frankly a computer can do better than you. Spend your time uh, creating content and, and you know, let computers take care of the computer stuff. Do you have any tips or <clears throat> strategies for, we'll take a step back, when you're starting out, you got all sorts of stuff in your head. It flows out. You got a few weeks of content, and then it dries up. Any tips for how to keep that funnel full from an editorial calendar standpoint, or how do you think about things, or what do you pay attention to? Um, you know, is it what's the? I mean, to us, for us, it was, you know, like every small publisher when you first start off, it's the one thing that holds you back mostly is just the self doubt and the anxiety. Obviously, because you have no clue what it is that you're doing, you constantly feel like, you know, you're you're being judged and you're putting yourself out there and your own voice, and that's scary. Um, to overcome that fear took a lot, it took many years. Only once you then, you know, once we saw the engagement and people were reacting in quite a positive way, which was surprising because typically, commentary online is not the friendliest. Um, Ours happened to be quite friendly, and that sort of kept us going. But um, I think that, you know, from a, th this well that you speak of, um, you know, we can be talking about sources of, of creativity and inspiration. There's always stuff out there that will guide you and direct you to write new content. Um, don't overthink it. If, if something comes to your mind, and it's probably going to be it, like, on a sleepless night at 3 a.m. and you're thinking, oh, wow, you know, let's write about that because that might be cool. Um, write it in a little notepad and write an article about it. Like Oliver said, don't, don't stress the certain things that computers can do for you. Um, write that content, see what sticks. If it doesn't stick, okay, move on to something else. But in all likelihood, because it's probably going to be unique because you thought it up and every person is unique and every person has a different background and has different ways to channel their passions, it's going to be unique and likelihood is, is that, you know, maybe it hasn't been done before. So just just go with it. Go with the flow. Um, so one, one interesting source of it is go to similar web and find sites that are like yours and go read those sites and see what they're writing about, right? That's, uh, that, I mean, obviously don't rip them off directly, but I think just get inspired by, by what your peers are talking about. Uh, another is... To the extent that you you do you know monetize through through affiliate networks, you can actually go find out what is actually being sold as a result of your content. Um, so we've had customers who say, you know, we always thought of ourselves as you know a, a technology site, but but looking at the products that actually transact as a result of uh, of of you know our content, we're actually more of an AV site uh, than an electronics site, and 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 we're going to sort of be shifting our, our coverage a little bit and focusing more around that. So just observing the data, you know, certainly in terms of page views and engagement, but also downstream, you know, commercial engagement is a good uh, is a good measure of what's resonating with your audience, and you can do more of that. Right. So look at analytics, page views. See, people are coming to you, which means you've got some sort of authority on a certain topic. Maybe that's not a post you can monetize, but think about maybe reviewing products in that same kind of topic and then link to it from there. You know, the odd, I, I have a quick example, which is completely oddball, uh, but kind of amusing. So um, as I mentioned, we have a purse forum, which first started off as a, as a discussion around designer handbags and then eventually into accessories and the big luxury brands and contemporary brands. But then we also started some off-topic discussions. And we had a health section many years ago. Um, and we started seeing a lot of traffic coming to this particular section. We're like, what's going on? It turns out is that Google, for whatever reason, had us uh, ranked first for the term Asian nose job. <laughs> Apparently, in, in uh, South Korea, it's a massive market. And so th this discussion was so active 
that it was one of the most active sections of our forum. People kept on signing up, having discussions about these, um, about uh, plastic surgery tourism and, and the most mind boggling thing. We had to actually create its own subsection, which is now trafficked and we have sponsors in there from Korea and, and all of that on a purse form. I don't know why it's strange, but again, pay attention to the analytics because there might be stuff resonating with readers and getting you traction that you may not really know about. So if you want info about Asian nose surgery, talk to me after this panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, good for you for just not ignoring it and saying we, this doesn't apply. Let's leverage it, right? Right. Um, so we talked, you talked about authentic, authenticity, you know, being yourself, being real. Um, wire cutter and, and that they kind of embrace the, their, the fact that they're making money off what they're doing. A lot of bloggers, I think, are reluctant to uh, monetize in any way because they feel like it's just wrong and, or they feel like their readers will think it's wrong. Um, how do you, uh, you know, what are some strategies for being authentic and monetizing at the same time? So. Authenticity is when the words coming out of your mouth match the ideas in your head. Um, and so if you feel like it's wrong to be monetizing, um, you know, then, then it is for you. Uh, I think there's sort of a dual-edged sword here. On one side, I definitely, uh, it's a big, I, I definitely talk to publishers who say, God, you know, how can I monetize? And I say, well, tell me about your audience. They're like, well, we haven't actually launched yet, but, you know, monetization is very important. And I would say, look, you need the audience. You know, there's just, there's no point in, in sort of optimizing around monetization and you know, uh, sort of spending time and energy on 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 that, and until you have an audience, so build an audience. However, I think another big problem is when you're like totally ad free and you you know you get a certain size audience, and you're like now I'm going to monetize, and you throw a bunch of ads in there, and people are like, man, this place sucks now. Like it used to be, sell out. So, yeah, you sell sold out. out. Uh, so so so, however you want to be, just start being that way now. Uh, and, and so if you're going to run ads, uh, run ads uh, from the beginning. If you're going to talk about products and sell them, do that and, and be unapologetic about it. Uh, and just say, look, you know, this is my business. This is how I make money. Um, you know, I got to quit my job or I'm hoping to quit my job because this business makes money. Uh, and, and, you know, I think just owning it uh, is, is the way to do it. Uh, trying to sneak things by does not work in the long run. Um, you know, and, and ultimately not only sort of gets penalized by the, by the big players out there is, you know, potentially illegal, depending on, on your view of the FTC rules. Uh, so I think just own it. I absolutely agree. I mean, transparency with your reader establishes trust. Um, what, and, and it's not really skin off their back. Um, they understand that if, if they want to be consuming your content, you as a publisher, you need to be doing this full time. Nobody works, well, most people don't work for free. Uh, at least it's not really sustainable. Quality content is absolutely not sustainable without making money. Um, I saw this wonderful piece actually, uh, a, a video where Tony Hawk uh, addressed this particular point of being a sellout. And I encourage everyone go on YouTube, look it up like um, Tony Hawk sellout. And it's a 30, 40 minute video where he addresses this very point. And it's, you know, it's basically a reflection of all publishers online that went into the game and started, you know, taking on um, deals and sponsorships and, uh, you know, paid advertisements and whatnot. It's, uh, you know, if you're, if you're transparent with your audience and you say, hey, listen, yes, I do get a cut. If you buy this product, I still stand behind it. I'm still, this is still my authentic voice but I'm just getting a kickback of a, a few percent or, um, you know, whatever. Uh, if, if you buy this and support me this way, the reader doesn't care. It's not like it comes out of their pocket. Um, they appreciate that you are upfront with them and they then reward you with their trust. So I don't, I, I, I don't think there's any shame or I wouldn't hesitate at all if I started a new site today in a completely different industry I do the same thing. I would look to monetize it. I would still, it wouldn't affect my passion. I would at least try for it not to, because then you do really become a sellout. It's a little problematic at times when there are certain issues that arise 
with, say, an advertiser that spends, you know, six figures a year on advertisements with you, and then they come to you and say, hey, listen, so there's this piece of content, like this negative review on one of our, you know, on one of our, you know, on our collection, and what do you think about that? That becomes problematic, and then you have to sit down and, and make a, you know, a, sort of like a choice. So, but, you know, hopefully that's not going to happen too frequently because it really puts you in an awkward position. But, uh, yeah. Shift gears a little bit. Um, what are your feelings on uh, types of content, uh, where things are headed? You know, do, do consumers want to read everything? It's video. Um, how does video play in? Um, or other medium? We find video harder to monetize at this point. I mean, I, you know, I, certainly uh, pre-roll advertising or, or sort of, uh, you know, uh, YouTube-style uh, skippable ads, uh, you know, are doing well out there. Obviously, there are huge YouTube sensation uh, celebrities, you know, who are, who are only celebrities on YouTube, which I think is always, uh, you know, novel for me. Um, you know, fr from an affiliate standpoint, I think it's quite hard uh, to monetize video. The technology's not really there. Uh, you know, we get into, like, the comments around YouTube sometime. Uh, you know, even though I sort of started the conversation uh, saying don't spend all your time optimizing for Google, it still is a big source of traffic, and, and Google is drawn to text. Uh, and so, you know, there needs to be text uh, around your, your sites. I, I, th I find it interesting. I mean, we were just chatting before the panel it does feel like the locus of, of energy on the web is shifting from what I would call the open web to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest. Um, there's probably one or two others I've missed. And, and I think that is interesting because they're very close platforms. Uh, they tend to um, you know, want a piece of the action, so to speak. I mean, Pinterest killed all affiliate links uh, and is now launching a buy button program, so you're welcome to... It's the Facebook strategy, right? You can pay to get promoted on their platform, and then when someone decides to buy, they'll take a cut of that too. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's that's interesting and perhaps worrisome development for the people in this room uh, because those platforms are getting so much power uh, and so much leverage with the merchants. Um, if the audience really shifts there too, it sort of it, it creates long-term problems. But so we still think text augmented by imagery is the easiest way to monetize, particularly for the people in this room. Uh, you know, but video is a huge component. I mean, depending on on uh, your your uh, subject matter. I mean, we do a lot with automotive, and and you kind of can't cover cars without video, uh, and and it's a big component. But as far as monetization goes, it's text plus imagery still. For affiliate, yes, um, but then when you're when you're lucky enough to amass uh, a certain uh, a certain traction within your video channel, which you know I can't really speak about because we don't do video yet, even though we are going to because it's you can't um, as a publisher you can't really do publishing without video these days anymore, and fortunately it is easier now than ever to be self-published on YouTube. I mean. Uh, the quality, you can now get a 4K camera for, with a lens, a sharp lens, uh, that's stabilized for $700 or something like that, pumps out tremendous quality, and you can you know, create a 4K channel in your industry for you know, close to nothing. Um, and once you then get that traction and you get in with maybe like a talent agency or something that will get you you know, a big, uh, a big campaign with, say, I don't know, Samsung or Reebok or Nike or Vitamin Water or whatever it may be. I mean, like, uh, like you said, the, there's YouTube sensations that over the years of publishing on YouTube, and whether it be doing, you know, trick shots over stadiums or uh, doing tech reviews out of a dorm room, uh, these kids, and for the most part, they're kids, they're killing it because they get these, these massive uh, endorsements that otherwise would have been reserved to, you know, sponsorships on NBC. Um, so I think video is extremely important, and, you know, I, I can't wait for us to really get into it and focus a lot of attention to it because so much time is being spent on YouTube these days. I mean, you, you all know as consumers, not just publishers and content creators, 
once you get stuck in YouTube, and I love car videos, I have 20 channels that I'm subscribed to, and once you fall into it, you're like, ooh, th there's a suggestion, you know, and then you just fall into that trap and you keep on watching content for two hours. My TV is being so neglected these days. Yeah, and there, there are the YouTube sensations, and we all hear about how they make a million plus a year from advertisements, but it's also the number two search engine. I think that's still oh, a yeah. correct yeah. stat. And people go there when they're trying to figure out how to do stuff. Yeah. And I think a, a good affiliate strategy there is, yes, it's difficult to monetize videos directly, but something that I have personal experience with is creating how-to videos. There's one where my shower valve broke, and I climbed in my shower with my video camera and with clothes on, and <laughs> I saw that one. <laughs> and I, and I, that might be a better chance of becoming no, not a sensation with that. But um, just changed my shower valve, Kohler, and you know I put some keywords in there, and it's got 200,000 views, and I have a link in the description that goes to my blog that has all the how to how to again with a link to go buy it. And, you know, I make a couple hundred bucks a month selling shower valves, you know, it's because they're not cheap. And I also don't mention that Kohler has a lifetime warranty and you don't actually have to buy these things. But um, <laughs> people would rather go to Amazon and spend 30 bucks now and get it tomorrow than deal with, with Kohler. But, you know, it, it's a, you, can, you can do that sort of thing and you don't have to monetize the videos directly. You can, it's, it can be a traffic source and drive it. If you're, if you're adding value and you're teaching somebody how to do something, you just save them a thousand dollar plumbing bill. You know, that's the kind of stuff that's also going to get links. Yeah. A, a comment that the, the CMO of eBay made to me a couple months ago was she said when she asks teenagers, you know, when you're looking for something on, on the web, like, where do you go to find it? Google? And they're like, Google? It's YouTube. Like, YouTube is the default search experience for people under 20. Mm -hmm. That is an interesting stat. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about uh, social media before. You know, what, and, and you talked about the sneaker guy actually monetizing Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, what are the best social media channels for, if you're not going to, you know, do the, just write and do the blog with links in it, what are some, what are the social media channels that are best for um, monetizing an e-commerce? So we do best on Twitter. Uh, Instagram makes it very difficult. Uh, Pinterest uh, looks like they want a piece of the action. Um, you know, Facebook, uh, Facebook can work, although I think it, it's usually a different uh, strategy. Uh, Teespring, for example, has a great program where uh, you, can, you can make shirt designs for free, promote them on Facebook, uh, and then they pay the affiliate 10 bucks a shirt uh, when they sell. So that's, it's a $20 shirt and half the revenue goes to the, to the affiliate, and they've, they've paid out an extraordinary amount of money to, uh, you know, to affiliates who are doing almost all their work on Facebook. So, so there absolutely are ways. Facebook, the, like, that particular strategy, though, requires paid promotion on Facebook. So you have to front the money, and it's easy to lose it, uh, you know, if, if people don't come and buy your shirt or, or whatever else it is you're pushing. Um, so I, I think for, for the no money down, uh, Twitter has definitely worked best for us. For us, I, uh, it, used to be, it used to be Facebook, just because we could... Uh, create bigger pieces of content and share them with, the, um, with our fans on Facebook. And for a while, we were also uh, paying a pretty, you know, a good amount of money in order to promote our page and grow our following. But then once those, uh, those algorithms were being pushed out and now we reach like a tiny, tiny subset of our fan base that we paid to establish, I'm like, no, I'm just not doing that anymore. Uh, I used much more colorful language, but that's not for this panel. Um, so, I mean, our focus right now in our industry, which, you know, is luxury fashion, is Instagram. Instagram is the, the love child of our industry. And, um, and brands are coming to us and saying, we want our product to be shown on your uh, Instagram page. We have close to 250,000 followers. Um, and so we have the luxury of being able to build out campaigns for these advertisers around Instagram content. Um, Twitter, um, Twitter is okay. Uh, we do see a good amount of engagement coming back to our site. Uh, affiliate, mm, not so much. Like we, our m biggest upselling point is definitely still our blog. Um, and yeah, like you said, Instagram for affiliate eh, doesn't really work. There are some solutions, but they're kind of tedious, and very few users actually want to go through that experience in order to then, you know, 
being able to be upsold. So it's do the brands who pay to be a part of your Instagram stream? Do they have any way to measure engagement, or they just they just know you did it, but they don't know how many users look? They at know it we did it. Through. It's brand it's brand marketing for them. Right. Um, you know, we we do get uh, positive feedback from many of our partners that say, you know, once we write an editorial piece or do uh, do a sponsored campaign around our site, you know, we great, get great feedback and a lot of engagement and a lot of you know lead generation, all of that and. So that works, no. But Instagram, no. They they measure likes, but right. What does that really mean? <laughs> it's a double tap of a thumb, and it's like three quarters of a second before you then swipe over it and go to the next one. So there's no longevity. Like on YouTube, you create content on YouTube, it lives on forever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was in my shower five years ago. So. Yeah. Uh, so you. You're big on Twitter, not so much for you, Lab, but I hear you're using it more to get drive people to your site. And I think the guys that I feel like you're talking about as being successful are it's their platform oh, and yeah. they're driving straight clicks straight to the certain we, we have right? publishers who are almost entirely on Twitter mm -hmm. uh, and monetize by putting up affiliate links. Right. It depends on your audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Tyler, the sneakerhead, he speaks to a, a young audience, and these are kids who you know spend. 50 to 200 300 dollars on sneakers and they live on twitter so he lives on twitter i don't think maybe he has a site i don't even know but he doesn't focus on it at all his affiliate income comes from twitter and he does it insanely success successfully uh -huh. so. good distinction so we talked about video we have to wouldn't be a panel if we didn't talk about mobile how does mobile play into this and uh from a from a monetization and affiliate standpoint, where's where are things going with mobile? So mobile is trending towards all the traffic, right? <laughs> it, it, it's really uh, you know obviously p computers will continue to exist, for, you know at least for the content creation part, but uh, you know really it's trending towards a hundred percent. As a, as a whole, uh, we see mobile monetizes more poorly than the web. That is shifting though, and there are certainly. Uh, particular merchants who do much better on mobile than they do on the web. So, so the obvious, like, stupid examples, iTunes, uh, you know, an impulse purchase of a song or an app, uh, you know, from your mobile device is actually much more common than on the web. But there are also other merchants uh, who do as well or better on mobile than on the web. Um, our view is that it's not that people don't want to shop on, on mobile, but the experience needs to be easy. So if it involves zooming in with two thumbs and typing in your credit card number, forget it. Um, you know, we see a lot of um, the, the, the retailers that put the time and energy in to build a mobile app, uh, you know, their conversion rates go way up. And we're very interested slash a little bit scared to see what happens with the buy buttons that have launched simultaneously on Google, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, um, and Facebook. Uh, you know, because at least, I mean, in the case of iTunes, they already have your payment instrument. Um, you know, Google probably has it from somewhere as well. Uh, you know, we find when the friction can be eliminated, conversion rates are just as good or better uh, on mobile than they are on the web, but that friction elimination has a long way to go. The tracking software for affiliate uh, commissions to pay through on mobile is not fully there. Uh, we work great on the mobile web, um, but uh, mobile apps require new tooling that they don't always have. Um, you know, we do a lot of clever things to make the right thing happen. You know, when you have the app, we can boot the app instead of taking you to the mobile website. Um, but it's not always sort of plumbed all the way through. That that will be happening over the next couple of years. I mean, I, I think there's not a retailer out there who doesn't understand, man, if I don't have something that converts well on mobile, I'm dead. Uh, and so it, it's a painful period where monetization actually does drop as your traffic shifts to mobile. But I think the long-term outlook is positive. People want to sh uh, shop on mobile. And their overall time spent goes up uh, with the emergence of the mobile platform. I agree. A lot of time spent on mobile, however, from a publisher perspective, it's a little painful because then it, we can be talking about the whole attribution and affiliate attribution problem. So when you get up in the morning, your alarm rings. You will probably spend eh, 10, 15 minutes laying around in bed doing this, right? Then you get up, you go to work, then you're on your big screen. Uh, you you know, screw the, the assignment you're supposed to do. You browse more of your favorite websites, like ours. You come back home, you're maybe sitting in front of your TV on your tablet. 
And then you go to bed, and before you fall asleep, you do probably a bit more of this. And that's a problem, because even though people spend a lot more time actually on your site, from an affiliate standpoint, you know, if that tap or that click happens on this device and then they come back to your site or then they complete their purchase on the desktop, you know, is there always that, you know, are you being attributed the, the, the credit that you're supposed to or not? Techniques are being developed in order to make this more seamless. Uh, however, affiliate has been struggling for us over the past few years because of the explosion and the time spent on these devices. So, yeah, um, everything, I mean, a friend of mine runs a really, really big um, photo-related website. And up until like a few months ago, he didn't even have a mobile website because he's like, ah, you know, I don't, people don't shop on these things, you know, screw it. And I'm like, Google, you can't screw it. Like you can't <laughs> ignore these devices because you're going to be out of business within two years. So, um, you know, mobile is important. And if I were to start now, I would probably start building my content and formulate my content around mobile first. Because the long tail, it only works for certain type, of, or the long form content, I mean, works for certain type of sites. Mobile users' attention span is like that big. So you have to do small bite sizes, convince them quickly that what it is where you're trying to steer them and direct them is worth it. And, um, you know, it's changed content a lot. So from a publisher affiliate standpoint, we kind of have to count on the networks and the technology providers to figure this cross-platform problem out. Make it work, Oliver. And they Make are. It Slowly, it's happening, so right? We have a ton of investment in it, uh, but you know, it obviously depends on downstream uh, merchants to some extent. But I, but I think certainly the, the, the old school way of doing things like just will not work in this world, right? If, if, if you're trying to capture the person who browses on mobile and goes home and, and converts on their tablet, the old school sort of copy-pasting a CJ link into your content, like you're just totally screwed. Uh, we, uh, you know, we have a big investment in sort of trying to sync across platform uh, and, and understand that those are the same people. Uh, it's, it's challenging. Um, you know, we, we do do clever things like when you're overseas, we show you the overseas version of the affiliate link rather than the domestic one. Uh, you know, so there are lots of clever things you can do to up the conversion rate. Uh, with the traffic you do have, and and mobile, we're start. You know, we've done things like making sure we boot the mobile app rather than the website. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of more work that still has to be done. You know, not just from us, but from the downstream merchants and affiliate networks. Um, and and yeah, you are relying on on technology providers like us, or the or the affiliate network, or the merchant. Uh, and it, it's it's taking time and it's painful. So for the publishers in the room, being on mobile. What does it mean? Just making sure your content is viewable? Uh, or is there advertising or other things that you, that you can do to I think the most obvious mobile? thing is Google explicitly punishes you if, you're, if your site is not mobile ready. Uh, so uh, you, know, you definitely want to escape that penalty. Uh, I think as Vlad said, that what you publish changes. It's shorter. Uh, you know, the font sizes and all that stuff needs to be much more mobile friendly, um, you know, liquid layouts and, and responsive layouts. Um, certainly that the ways uh, that, that people monetize are different. So banner ads are, you know, have limited success on the web, and I'd say, you know, vanishingly small success on mobile. Um, much more common are the, the native sort of in-stream in ads or, um, you know, the cards, like product cards. Uh, and so, as Vlad said, I, I would actually, if you're starting now, I would actually think like mobile is your platform, and the web is kind of a, a side issue that's shrinking, uh, certainly on a percentage basis. Uh, and, and so that should be the primary consumption uh, method you have. I mean, Vlad told the story of like, and then you go to work and look at your big screen, but that's a very like 30, 35 plus mindset. Oh yeah. Uh, if you're under 20 going to work, you still got your phone in your hand. Uh, and, and, or you're at school and you've got your phone in your hand. It's all mobile all the time. And you have to also look at who's your target audience. You know, it sort of goes back to Tyler the Sneakerhead marketing to millennials who are on Twitter all day. Our audience is more, you know, established. Um, because certainly you're not going to find many 16-year-olds who can spend $5,000 on a Fendi bag. Uh, so fortunately, we still have, 
you know, you know, have those ingrained uh, patterns where, you know, my generation or older, that you're more comfortable on a desktop because you have that real estate, you can consume it in a different way, and this just gets really frustrating. Um, so again, you have to look at who's your, who's your target audience. If you're targeting younger people, do mobile only. Like, don't even bother with a website because they're not going to consume it because it's like, what's, what's a blog, really, to a millennial nowadays? No, it's all, it's all YouTube, it's all Twitter, it's all Instagram. Um, so, you know, you have, to, you have to shape your content depending on who your target audience is and what their expectations are. Uh, there was a, an interesting video that went viral a, a few days ago where millennials were, um, or teen well, t teenagers were being shown an iPod 1, and they were trying to swipe it. And be like, why isn't this working? Like, think about who your audience is. If it's, if it's uh, younger people, they're expecting to swipe and tap on their phone. So make your call to action targets big enough and prominent enough that they're easy to tap with a finger. A small text link within, a, within an article, it's not easy to tap on. So your con you know, conversions on mobile will hence suffer. So think about that. Good, yeah. All right, one more question, and, and I'm going to leave some time for questions. So if, think about your questions, and we'll spend 10, 15 minutes on that. Um, when you start to get more serious about content and you start to think about what it costs to create content and maybe even hire writers part-time or even full-time editorial staff, you need, to be, you need to know what the value of the content is that they're creating, right? How do you measure the value of a piece of content um, so you know what it, so you know your budget, so you know what you've got to spend. What's the, do you have, do you have anything there? I mean, on our end, we never really looked at it that granularly. I mean, obviously, we're looking at, at, at pieces of content and seeing generally what type of categories resonate well, um, and then we certainly look at analytics too because you can do all this, uh, you know, specific tracking on every article, and then you look at link share or. Um, our, our big link stats or commission junction, then you see, oh, okay, that piece of content generated X amount of revenue. Um, but overall, we look more at the, you know, the bigger picture. Be like, okay, so what's, how much revenue are we generating? Can we really, do we need to fill these positions? Like, are we looking to, um, are we short staffed or not? Or should we get someone who's in tech or someone who's in marketing? So it gets a whole lot more complicated, obviously, the bigger you get, but early on, I mean, uh, again, you can do it on a, on a sort of perhaps like a, like a ref share basis, you know. Um, bring on a writer, a young writer who's passionate and say, you know, if you get a cut of, of the revenue you generate per article and if the quality is high, if it enga engages people, you will benefit from it as well. And that's a motivating factor. Mm -hmm. So. I think uh, if you've ever, you know, gone to business school or done some financial modeling, you, you sort of, you learn to build a spreadsheet where it's sort of like next year, the year after, the year after that, and then every year for the rest of time after that is in the sort of rightmost column. And, and typically when you're valuing things, it's that rightmost column that, that really adds all the value, uh, you know, to, to, like your, your total value is mostly in years five through infinity and not one through four. Uh, and so... You know, we see that a tiny percentage of the content drives a large majority of the of the um, revenue, uh, and they tend to be the sort of evergreen pieces. So, um, you know, five things to buy when you're listening to Donald Trump as a presidential candidate probably has a half life of a year at best. Whereas, you know, five uh, timeless Valentine's Day gifts, uh, you know, you're going to be getting traffic on that. Um, you know, when you're old and gray. So, so I think. Um, tools like Viglink and, and others let you sort of understand which particular pieces are driving the engagement, what are they selling, uh, and it, it will be a tiny fraction uh, of, the, of the content that drives all the value. I, I'd say the other, that sort of, that tells you about engagement and longevity. The other key piece of this, of course, is how much, you know, how much revenue does each piece of engagement get you, right? If, if you sell something, are you earning 4% or 15%? Obviously, that makes a big difference. I'd say that really comes down to leverage. Um, when you're big like Vlad, you can say, look, if you want me to write about you, this is the rate, you know, take it or leave it. If you are a tiny blogger, you probably can't even get the merchant to return your phone call. We, we Viglink tries to sort of 
effectively unionize a lot of small bloggers and say, look, each of the people on our platform isn't necessarily you know, powerful, but as an aggregate, we have a lot of influence here. And so you need to give us a better rate. Um, but you know, leverage is really the key thing. I think um, Vlad referred to it with Facebook. You know, we paid to create this audience, and now they won't even have, let us have access to, to our own audience. And, and that's a case of Facebook saying, you know, what are you going to do about it? Uh, I spoke to a, a major retailer who said, you know, you talk about the sort of incrementality of the affiliate channel, but a year ago I cut my rate in half, and today I do more business than I did a year ago. So what are you going to do about it, right? And and so it's really about creating liquidity. What what Viglink has spent a ton of time investing in is the ability to shift traffic around and say, you know, we're point. This is a. It's harder with Fendi bags, but you know, with with a commodity product like a pair of Nike shoes, we can say you're not the only people who sell this shoe. Nike Town sells them. So does Foot Locker. So does you know five other merchants, and we can figure out which one of you is willing to pay for the most for the click and redirect the traffic appropriately. And so, creating leverage over the merchants uh, is really what drives up the revenue you can command. And for that, you, you either need to be big yourself or you need to sort of unionize collectively with a bunch of other small bloggers. All right. Have any, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Right. Yes, correct. We've been around for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the question is, uh, when we first started, uh, did my wife first write, uh, and how much did she write before we had an editorial team? Um, yes, it was all her initially. Um, we started with like an article a day. Um, not really consistently, because we didn't take it too seriously at first. Because you have to remember, this is 2005. So 2005, you're just sort of like blogs and, and publishing, um, individual publishing is like, you know, in its, in its infancy. So you don't really know what to expect. Um, a few months into it, and really, we were writing some atrocious articles. I mean, seriously, if you go back through our archives, I've had to unpublish a whole bunch of stuff because it was outright vulgar. <laughs> Seriously, there was uh, some interesting product being covered. Um, anyway, so uh, we put that out there, and then um, I think the, the, the really breakaway moment came when my Yahoo or my.yahoo.com, which had like a little RSS aggregator on the side, you know, you would have your email, you would have your weather, you would have your headlines, and then you would be able to include an RSS feed in the side when people still cared about RSS feeds. Um, and one day we were suggested by Yahoo as the suggested feed of the day. And our traffic just went like, poof. it it melted our servers. We got like 200,000 RSS subscribers in like one day. And we're like, whoa, like we need to take this seriously. So we then started really paying attention to it and uh, brought on, I think we brought on our first um, editor about a year and a half or two years in a year and a half in or so, and then just uh, built from there and started, you know, filling in the different niches. Like, we have a girl who only talks about celebrity. Then we have one girl who puts together, like, these social pieces on our site. So, you know, you, you look at what works, and then you fill in those positions. And um, if you can't afford it, always reinvest back into your business. I mean, it's nice to sit on your success, but it really makes most sense to put it back into your baby and, and build it up to where it can be. Okay, so the question is, how do we uh, promote our, our content after it's published? So typically, so we have a, um, we have a schedule. We, we publish at, at 10, at noon, at 2, and at 4, uh, typically. And then um, our social media team afterwards, uh, after the, you know, the content is published, they, they push it out to the different platforms. Um, on Twitter, we reuse a lot of actually content, some of the evergreen content, like uh, Oliver mentioned. It's always great to fill in if there is like a void. So because we have the pieces like 10 reasons why you should be owning a Chanel bag. That's one of the 
biggest pieces. We have over like 1.6 million page views on that one piece alone because it, it's always relevant. So when we feel like, hey, there's a bit of a lull and we don't have anything exciting to talk about, you can always recycle content, throw it up on Twitter. And the, remember, the half-life of a tweet is like 40-some minutes. So you can always, on Twitter in particular, reuse content pretty frequently and the user will either not know that you're reusing it or they will tolerate it because it's, and everyone does it. Or forget. Or forget, that's right. So on Twitter, you can always, you know, always stay in people's, in people's minds by you know, reusing it. And then sometimes we will get spikes, unforeseen spikes, because something that was maybe listed on Facebook and reused on Facebook gets like a lot of traction. People get excited over it for whatever reason, and then it will spark up as like a trending topic of the day, even though it may be nine months old or 15 months old. So it sort of fluctuates and sometimes really unpredictable, depending on the mood or people's mindsets. And Vlad has a team, but you don't necessarily need a team to do that stuff. You can find tools that... Like Buffer is great to you know schedule tweets, schedule your entire social media um, presence around yeah. it. And, and schedule things out with, with Buffer and, and Hootsuite and, and Cherist. Cherist, um, right. You know, we have features that, and others do too, that allow you to schedule things to repeat, but also schedule things to recycle. Uh, so you can backfill when there's a, an empty slot. It'll just kind of pick up something that you've set to recycle and throw it out there a month after it was last recycled and things like that. And you can just keep your and, – and don't be afraid to promote yourself. You know, that, you know, that is, I think, wherever your audience is, shout about it. I think somebody, you know, told me – I forget who it was, but, um, you know, you should be spending 20% of your time creating the content and 80% of it promoting it. Mm. And – you know, make sure you're, you know, you're getting it out there. And, and like Vlad said, Twitter is a great place to hit it out there again and again and again. Even if your Facebook page, you can put some evergreen stuff out, um, you know, weeks and months apart. And remember, there's a lot of noise out there. Every person every day is being bombarded with thousands of pieces of marketing at all times. From this room to the subway station, you will probably see 500 advertisements or marketing points that will try to get your attention. So you have to, you know, if you have a brand, if you have a presence online, you have to continue being on, on people's, like, eyeballs because the stream of information is always there. So, you know, you have to find the right balance between obnoxious self-promotion and staying relevant. And people are going to consume things where they consume things. So some people are on Twitter, some are on Facebook, some are in email primarily. Um, you know, so you're going to hit all those things. And you can put stuff out on all those channels, and it's probably not going to be a whole lot of overlap in who's reading it. Right. And you can take all of your tweets for the week, put the important stuff in an email, and send it out as a recap. You know, just keep the stuff flowing out. Over here first. Hi, uh, Eric Collins with Smile Point Digital. Uh, you guys have some cool video. Uh, this is the first time at a Twitter summit, and I'm seeing you guys are starting to uh, have fun with five new digital content that are created. What kind of content is it? Well, it could be anything. So what I'm starting with here is uh, content shooting and just evergreen kind of stuff. So for the video, the, the question is, you know, any tips on, you know, is there something can be done about monetizing video? We kind of threw in the towel earlier. But I mean, I, I, I think anything? YouTube is probably your best option at this point, right? That, that you can monetize uh, on YouTube and, and Google will run uh, pre-roll, uh, skippable pre-roll ahead of time, and, and we'll share it with you. Uh, you know, like everything, the best deals go to those with the massive audiences, right? And, and it's hard to raise your hand and ask for that deal. They come to you. Um, but I think, you know, YouTube certainly takes care of the hosting, streaming, delivery, and, and to some extent the monetization, although, again, it comes down to a question of leverage. You don't have a lot, uh, and so they throw effectively peanuts at you. Uh, but I, I think that really is your best option to date. I don't know if you're... And there, are, there are companies that are thinking about this pr problem, and like Vubix, yeah. if you've heard of them, V-I-E-W-B-I-X, creating overlays and, you know, things that you can put on top of video yeah. to click on. 
Cool, C O U L L. That's another company. Um, it's it's all pretty early though. All right, we have one minute. Last question, quick one. So the question is um, reputation management, dealing with negative content. You get a negative piece. How much content do you have to write to overcome it? Hmm. There, are, there, are, there are vendors like reputation.com, and I think LifeLock maybe has a B2B uh, practice where, where they, they work to essentially try to drown out the negative uh, you know, content about you. I mean, I think the most... Uh, the best strategy there is to try to not get the negative content to begin with, uh, and uh, you know that that involves um, sort of not doing some of the the common negative practices. But obviously, bad reviews happen, uh, and I think um, certainly directly addressing it on on in the place. So Yelp has a great uh, feature now where. Um, you know, vendors can respond directly to a negative review and say, like, I'm really sorry you had a bad experience. Here's what happened. We tried to fix it. And, and that anecdotally has, has a big impact. Um, you know, and if it's not Yelp, you know, certainly comments and blog posts. Um, you know, I, th I, th I, don't, I don't have a golden rule ratio of how much there is. Uh, definitely, though, you know, negative, negative stuff does have a bigger impact than positive stuff. So you have to work pretty hard not to get... Uh, negative stuff. We we the similar rate. The, the thing we experience as Viglink is the ratio between revenue and breaking someone's site is extraordinary. Right? You you can be sending them thousands of dollars a month, and if you know you sort of break their site once, they're like, "That's it, you're out." <laughs> right? And it, it it's sort of interesting how lopsided that that is, and so how really hardcore you have to be about quality of service and and sort of not screwing up because it's it's very easy to lose you know uh, contact. I think rather than trying to drown it out with more content, you know, it's going to happen. So drown it out with kindness, own it, and just take it head on. Don't delete it. Don't delete it. <laughs> um, you know, just get out there and be honest and, and you know, do your best to, you know, uh, just own the, own the comment. And if you have to fall on your sword or if you, you know, just need to uh, talk about it in public, do it. Our time is up. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.